Hi, this is Brent Compton. I'm a Senior Director of the Storage Solution Architecture Team here at Red Hat. This whiteboard session is Why Spark on Ceph? A couple of years ago, it came to our attention that a few of our very large customers were using a Ceph object store to back their large Spark and Hadoop analytics clusters. So my team of architects engaged with them to understand, first off, why? You know, it's, you know, Hadoop and Spark have been in the marketplace for a long time. There's a well-defined practice for using HDFS as the back end for Spark and Hadoop, MapReduce, et cetera. So why were they doing this? That was the first question. The second question is, which analytics engines would work with Ceph as a back-end object store uh, to Spark and Hadoop analytics? And the third, of course, as we then spoke with more and more customers, the question on everybody's mind is, what would the performance tax be uh, for running Spark and Hadoop backed by a Ceph object store? So my team of architects uh, engaging with the architects from these large companies and uh, a, a nice lab provided to us by Quanta Cloud Technologies um, set off to answer these questions empirically. Um, so let's kind of answer the first question first in terms of why would they do this? So here was the scenario in which uh, they found themselves. Back in the day, they had a couple of folks running Hadoop and all was good. It was kind of in the back, uh, you know, the, the, the backwoods of their organization um, and not a lot of contention. It was kind of a toy. Uh, but then, uh, you know, enter into the current age, uh, the uh, digital transformation age, whatever you want to call it, where businesses are data-driven. And not just companies selling stuff online, but every business becoming more and more data-driven. And so what, what started with a couple of folks running Hadoop in the, in the back room somewhere became many, many teams running a, an explosion of analytics tools where, where there was, you know, uh, um, MapReduce, there became Spark SQL on Spark on Yarn and Hive on MapReduce uh, on Yarn and Presto and Impala and Kafka and the list goes on. So an explosion of people using the analytics clusters and an explosion of analytics tools. The net result of that led to effectively this team saying, hey, um, my jobs aren't completing in time because you know, Bob's team saying, John's team's using, you know, hogging all the resources. Like, my jobs aren't finishing in time. So um, Bob's team saying, this is intolerable, uh, intolerable for me. I need to have my own analytics cluster. Um, so, you know, um, going to the infrastructure teams, uh, so this dilemma of saying, you know, Bob saying, hey, John's team hogging all the resources, I need to have more. So the infrastructure teams were faced effectively with three choices. And this is what, as we convened, uh, we met in some type of an architectural summit, we brought together architects from several different large companies and, and effectively posed these questions. And here is the, uh, here is the, here are, are the alternatives uh, that these architects uh, told us. They said, well, the first alternative is we could just get a bigger cluster. You know, running out of resources, we'll just get a bigger cluster. Of course, as you know, that just uh, delays the inevitable. Uh, so what most of them went to is, oh, we'll just get more clusters. Bob, okay, fine, we'll give you your own, your team your own cluster. John's team will have his own cluster. So some of the very large institutions uh, that we've met with are up to 55 separate standalone analytics clusters. Um, so let's, let's pause there for a moment and talk about the, uh, the impact to an organization and why many of these organizations found that intolerable. The primary reason was cost. Um, so HDFS by default is not a shared resource between analytics clusters. So you have you had this cluster with its own HDFS store. You had this cluster with its own HDFS store. This cluster with its own HDFS store, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And back to the case, the most uh, egregious case of you know, one company having 55 analytics clusters. Well, now think about if each of these data sets is, say, 10 petabytes, 
and the majority of that data needs to be copied from, you know, be available in that cluster and that cluster, so maybe eight petabytes of that there, maybe six petabytes of that there. All of a sudden, what was a 10 petabyte um, cost expense to the company becomes 10 petabytes times, you know, how many clusters? If you're, you know, you're replicating that data set across 50 different clusters, maybe even half that data set. So um, 10 petabytes cut in half, to five petabytes, copied times 50 clusters, all of a sudden the expenses balloon from 10 petabytes or five petabytes to 250 petabytes. So just from a pure CapEx standpoint, became an untenable um, situation for many of these companies. And that's from the CapEx standpoint. Um, from the OPEX standpoint, again, this, this same large company that had you know, 55 separate analytics clusters, said because they need to have a copy of the same data sets across the different analytics clusters, um, found that uh, they had a rat's nest of scripts to copy this data set from here, this data set from here, this data set from here, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, brittle, fragile, a lot of room for human error. So the operational expense of maintaining um, copies across that became, un uh, became very difficult. So there are uh, additional reasons, but th these are two very large reasons why these companies said, listen, this, uh, getting a bigger cluster wasn't a good alternative for us because that delayed the inevitable. It would run out of resource. They said, we tried giving uh, you know, teams their own clusters, uh, but ran into those uh, untenable CapEx and OpEx um, costs, leading them to uh, this paradigm here, uh, the third, which was, hey, more clusters, but with a common object store. So instead of having this 10 petabytes copied here, here, and here, it's just the 10 petabytes, or in, in some of these cases, some of these folks are dealing with 50 petabytes, some of these folks are dealing with hundreds of petabytes, but in one shared repository. So they need to have uh, a, another, spin up another analytics cluster, fine. And in fact, um, uh, very frequently, for instance, a data science team, they're more of an exploratory team. Um, they're, they frequently want to run the latest and greatest analytics uh, um, versions and engines very different from the batch team who has, you know, running the, uh, the, the daily mission critical batch jobs that need to have stability. They, they specifically do not want um, the, uh, um, the latest and greatest versions. They want the stable versions so that their jobs, uh, you know, continue to run without disruption. So you have that same contention of, you know, data scientists say, I, I need to spin up a new cluster. I've got a hot new project. Um, I, I need my own analytics cluster, and I need it to run with XYZ new tool, you know, the latest version of, of TensorFlow, you know, you name it, uh, uh, um, latest distribution. Um, so uh, effectively, they wanted the, uh, the agility of multiple clusters with the power of a common object store. So agility up top, commonality at the bottom. And so that's what led these companies to this particular architecture of using, in this case, it, it, using Red Hat infrastructure. So in, in a couple of these cases, using Red Hat OpenStack for, um, for dynamic provisioning of the resources for infrastructure to run their analytics workloads, and a Ceph shared data lake or a, a Ceph object store to be the common object store underneath those multiple analytics clusters. Now, uh, some of you may uh, say, well, that's, that's how we do it in AWS. That's how we've done it in AWS for the last couple of years. And that's exactly right. Um, spinning up, uh, you know, uh, using uh, um, EC2 to spin up um, the appropriate resources, the infrastructure resources underneath Spark or Hadoop, you know, as many clusters you need backed by AWS S3, Common Object Store. So, People saying, you know, data analysts, data scientists coming to these companies and say, I want to have the same experience, the same agility and sharing as I experience in the public cloud. I want to have that uh, in my private cloud on premises as well. The agility of being able to rapidly spin up multiple analytics clusters while sharing a common object store at the back end. So that answers the, the first question now. I'll just briefly close. Uh, with, a, with the last two, which is, okay, so which analytics tools will work with Ceph uh, uh, object store as a back end? 
because of the amount of momentum in the industry behind the S3A Hadoop file system adapter, um, lots of community support behind that, Ceph in the right place at the right time. Um, Ceph being the most popular open source, private cloud, S3 compatible object store, uh, benefits from all of the community uh, momentum and work behind S3A. Ceph is the beneficiary of that from an on-premises standpoint. So these analytic engines, so for instance, uh, a lot of our empirical work uh, um, soon to be published through a blog series in reference architecture, a lot of our empirical work as we've reproduced what some of these large companies have done, running for instance a lot of Spark SQL on Spark on Yarn workloads, absolutely, you know, effectively replacing the, uh, the fully qualified uh, uh, path name from Hadoop with an S3A endpoint. So right inside the syntax of the query itself, replacing a name, uh, f uh, a fully qualified path name in HDFS with an S3A bucket endpoint. Um, that straightforward. So um, likewise, uh, um, Hive on MapReduce on Yarn, same, uh, same type of compatibility. Um, so that's where we've spent most of it. We also, you know, Impala, Presto. So those are the areas in which we spent most of our time and found uh, um, no problems with running those queries and jobs, whether they were read-only queries or, or uh, update transformation type jobs, uh, running in that uh, spectrum of jobs uh, against a SF S3 object store directly. So not going through HDFS and then trickling down to Ceph as a cold store, but run, running those jobs directly against a Ceph shared object store. So that was kind of answer to question number two. And the answer to question number three, I'll just kind of leave you here with the hand because it's number three. You, you, most, peop, most of you are going to say, show me the data. Uh, um, so to be published in the blogs and the reference architectures. But I'll end with this. Why were these large companies using a, a Ceph shared object store behind their multiple analytics clusters? Reason number one was they had, they had gone past the point of get a bigger cluster, wouldn't work for them. They had tried getting more clusters and had experienced the CapEx and the OpEx pain behind that as we discussed. And they'd settled on number three. They wanted the agility of multiple analytics clusters with the power of a shared data lake, a common object store. That was the why, and we've since spoken with, uh, oh, it's been about 30 different companies and found this similar pattern uh, disrupting the status quo inside of the analytics space. And then finally, the, the big question is, great idea, but will it work? Um, our empirical tests, we've probably run at this point four or 5,000 different query tests, illustrates, yes, it does work. And the performance is actually quite nice. Uh, I'm Brent Compton. Thanks for joining me.